to start our forum off, um, we would like to hear from um, for, for welcoming remarks. Um, she is a professor at the UP College of Law and um, the director of the UP Institute of Human Rights and also of Represent, and also a lecturer at the Philippine Judicial Academy. Um, please welcome attorney Elizabeth Aguiling Pangalangan. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, members of Congress, uh, our guest speaker, uh, Congressman Edsel Lagman, Congressman Marcoleta also. Friends, good afternoon to all of you. Welcome to the University of the Philippines and to the UP Institute of Human Rights, which is part of the UP Law Center. We are honored by your presence today. This year, the College of Law celebrates its centennial year, and that means that we have for the past 100 years, taught law in a grand manner, which is what we claim, and I hope no one here will contest that or contradict that. But aside from teaching law, we have also enhanced legal scholarship by engaging in research and encouraging legal dialogue on, on various pressing issues of our time. This day, we also celebrate, although a day early, the International Human Rights Day. That is why it was very important for us, uh, for us, no matter how small the group is, to come together to celebrate this day. We have two special events. We take this occasion to invite and hear from legislators, particularly from the principal author and the moving force behind the RH bill, Congressman Ed Selagman. He will speak to us about the challenges the passage of the bill has faced in Congress and perhaps also the prospects of it becoming law. I've worked with Congressman Lagman for several years and appreciate his commitment, perseverance, and firm belief in the cause of delivering reproductive health care through information services and provisions for our people, especially for the poorest of the poor, and giving respect always for the decisions they themselves make. I also often wonder at how he can be on his feet at the lectern for four to five hours grueling hours during interpolation, responding to questions, half of which were already asked and answered several times over. And during the talk with Congressman Marcoleta, he tells me also of his experience for three continuous days, asking questions already answered. Likewise, today we launched a primer on legal issues and reproductive health. In the primer, we have specifically tackled the issues classified into the following. Constitutional law, written by Professor Florine Hilbay, your professor in con law. Family law issues, including women's and children's rights, by yours truly. International law issues, by Professor Harry Roque and reproductive health as part of the internationally protected right to health by former law dean Dr. Raul Pangalangan. Unfortunately, both Harry and Dean Raul are in another forum at the field just so they cannot join us today. The primer does underscore that reproductive rights are human rights already recognized by the Philippines in the various human rights instruments we have already signed and on the basis of our own 1987 constitution and several statute law. As I stated in my preface, while the primary focuses on the legal aspects of reproductive health rights, we should realize that our laws are based on policies that seek to protect actual human lives and concrete interests. Therefore, more than a debate at the level of theory and theology amongst men who cannot give birth and who are not poor, including priests who do not have sex or are not supposed to have sex, the conversation must include and in fact be yielded to women whose bodies and beings are literally at stake. The idea of writing this primer came after several discussions between the Reproductive Health Rights and Ethics Center, or REPROSEN, and the Philippine Legislators Committee on Population and Development, PLCPD. So I thank these institutions as well as the UP College of Law for all the efforts, the time, and commitment to this project. Again, welcome to everyone. Thank you. To introduce our guest speaker, please welcome Attorney Elvira Acuesta Duavit. Sure, 
Our guest speaker for today is Congressman Edsel C. Dagman. He is the principal author of House Bill 4244, or the Responsible Parenthood, Reproductive Health, and Population and Development Act of 2011. He is on his sixth term as representative of the 1st District of Albay and is currently the minority floor leader of the House of Representatives. As a legislator, Representative Lagman has consistently been chosen as outstanding congressman from 1987 to 1998 and from 2004 to 2011. He was also chosen as the number one congressman of the 9th Congress by the prestigious Consumers Welfare Foundation of the Philippines, whose awards committee is composed of retired Supreme Court justices, bishops, newspaper publishers, presidents of civic clubs, and student leaders. In 2000, he received the Golden Scroll Award for Public Service and the Mamamayang Ayaw sa Droga Award. A staunch advocate of reproductive health and population development, quality education, agrarian reform, the eradication of grafting corruption, and the empowerment of LGUs, among others, Representative Lagman has authored several laws such as Republic Act 9346, an act prohibiting the imposition of the death penalty in the Philippines, Republic Act 9502, or the university accessible, or universe, sorry, Universally Accessible Cheaper and Quality Medicines Act of 2008, Republic Act 6657, or the Comprehensive Agrarian Reform Law, together with RA 8532 and RA 9700, both of which extended the land acquisition and distribution component of the Agrarian Reform Program. A graduate of the UP College of Law, Representative Lagman was admitted to the bar in 1967. He was a Bienvenido Gonzalez Memorial Law Scholar and a member of the Order of the Purple Feather. He received his AB in the university in 1962, graduating cum laude and a recipient of the UP Presidential Pin for Academic Excellence. Let us all welcome today Congressman Lagman. Thank you, Attorney Elvira Cuesta Duabit, for that kind introduction. Members of the faculty, the authors of uh, the primer on legal issues in reproductive health, a stone's uh, advocate, Congressman Marcoleta. I'm sorry that uh, Congressman uh, Romaldo. <laughs> Romaldo. <laughs> Romaldo. If uh, one does not really uh, ask uh, good questions, I forget his name. <laughs> <laughs> Fellow RH advocates and students of law. The variations of the RH bill have been installed in the legislative gauntlet for over 12 years. Since the first comprehensive bill was filed in 1999 during the 11th Congress, the travails of the RH bill continue despite favorable and enabling indicators like surveys after survey, nationwide, regional, and local, which document the people's vast and continuing support for the measure, with 71% nationwide saying that it must be enacted without further delay. In fact, local surveys would even yield a better percentage, 86% in Manila, 89% in Paranaque, and 88% in Cebu. Why do I have to highlight uh, these places? Because these are the places where the congressmen are opposing the measure, despite the fact that their constituents favor the enactment of the bill. 
if we are truly representative of our people, then let us uh, enact what they rightly so demand that Congress must do. 68% responding that the government has authority to use public funds for family planning, including the procurement and distribution of medically safe, legal, and truly effective contraceptives. Again, 64% in Manila, 70% in Paranaque, and 75% in Cebu. Voters prefer candidates who have an agenda on family planning. This is a consistent result in almost two decades of surveys. And then finally, the vast majority of the respondents are Catholics. The Philippines is a signatory to relevant international conventions promoting and protecting the salient elements of reproductive health, as earlier mentioned by Professor Beth. And I would like to cite some of them. I think these are also included in the uh, booklet on uh, the primer on legal issues. The Tehran Convention on Human Rights, upholding the rights of parents to freely and responsibly determine the number and size of their children. The 1994 International Conference on Population and Development, ICPD, Program of Action. The Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And uh, these are all parts of the law of the land, and no less than the Constitution would uphold the right to self, to reproductive self-determination. Another uh, important, encouraging, and enabling uh, factor is President Aquino has endorsed to the Legislative Executive Development Academy, no, Development Advisory Council, LEDAC, and to the Congress the enactment of the RH bill as a priority administration measure. And in today's papers, you must have read that he's becoming impatient with the uh, prolonged debates in the House. I hope the Speaker of the House will be equally impatient so that we could uh, fast track the enactment of the bill. In this connection, it is pertinent to us whether the President is doing enough to assure the passage of the RH bill. Maybe prioritization is not sufficient. The President has to do more to convince his congressional allies that the enactment of the RH bill is imperative as an indispensable tool to achieve sustainable human development. The arsenal of the presidency to rally support for a measure or agenda is legendary. This time, the weaponry of power can be used by the president for the good of the greatest number. The multitude of the marginalized and disadvantaged, particularly women and children, who are the direct and immediate beneficiaries of the RH bill. The challenges to the RH bill are not cerebral. <laughs> they are mundane and parochial. They cannot even be elevated to 
challenges. They are just plain obstructions, like the following. Problem of quorum. Two repetitive uh, questions, or what I may call recidivist interpolation. <laughs> and absentee interpolators. The political equation, and fourth, the fear factor. Quorum. It is a truism that the act of legislation is a numbers game. The numbers could be herded, mob-like, and unthinking. But they are numbers just the same. Numbers are needed to enact. And lack of numbers is useful to delay legislation. The lack of a quorum is a convenient excuse, albeit legal, to stall legislation. The absence of a quorum can even be contrived or intentional. It is for this reason that we have continuously reminded our its authors and advocates to be present at all times. But even they cannot subscribe to this strict discipline. The solution is for the leadership of the House to take the bold initiative and enforce the rules, including sanctions for absenteeism. Leniency must be jettisoned. It is a bane to policy making. Recidivist interpolations. After 12 years of debate inside and outside the halls of Congress, all relevant and irrelevant questions have been asked about the Arits Bill. There is absolutely no new argument or noble misconception. We call again on the leadership of the House of Representatives to adapt, issue, and enforce the rules of engagement, which bans repetitive questions and limits the interpolator's time to not more than one hour in order to foreclose inordinate delay. In the case of uh, Congressman Dante Marcoleta, he has been interpolated for four session days, and it is not even terminated. You know? But if we had the rules issued by the Speaker since it was submitted to him in August, then that kind of delay can be foreclosed. Political equation. Politics is addition. To a politician, every vote counts, even the vote of the devil. Hence, a politician reaches, reaches out to all. Although there is no Catholic vote, an ordinary politician, as much as possible, will not dare displease his bishop or get the ire of the church. Consequently, he usually defers or succumbs to the importuning of the clergy. The solution is a strong political will on the part of politicians, more particularly members of the Congress, and a steadfast commitment to a cause. This should be buttressed by a full realization that the RH advocacy is supported by the people. And there is a popular rejection of the undue interference of the church hierarchy in secular affairs. Then we go to the fear factor. The macabre instruments of torture and terror employed for ages by despots and ecclesiastics are merely secondary to the pervasive and malevolent instigation of fear to secure blind adherence 
and break principled resistance. The Catholic Church has long perfected the policy and practice of instilling fear in both the faithful and prospective converts. The fear of sin has been conceptualized and propagated by clerics in order to make their ministry continually relevant. As they intercede on behalf of sinners for God's pardon and mercy. The fear of eternal damnation and hellfire has coerced or frightened people to obey church dogma and has subdued crusading dissenters against the teachings of the faith. Nowhere in recent years has the church mastery of the fear factor been put to much exploitative use than in the current debates on the reproductive health bill, fear of contraceptives, fear of demographic winter, and fear of promiscuity, among others. The Catholic Church peddles the fear and lie that contraceptives like pills, IUDs, and injectables induce abortion, are aborted patients, and will definitely lead to cancer. A demographic winter, which is a scare tactic, according to them, would lead to the decimation of the Filipino race. And sexuality education will create a breed of sex maniacs. <laughs> and if you are uh, in the halls of Congress, in the House of Representatives, you will know how uh, some of our uh, members would ate these uh, statements of the Catholic hierarchy. The solution to fear is to foster the truth. Those who capitalize on fear are bankrupt in reason. They cannot compete in the free market of ideas. Fear has to be confronted and dismantled because it is the antithesis of truth and free choice. These challenges, more appropriately obstructions, are not insuperable. They are feeble posturing and mainly deletory tactics. But delay is not victory. It just temporizes the eventual and certain triumph of a progressive and much needed RH law. In our inevitable victory, we truly count on the unwavering support of the NGO community, which prominently includes the represent and the steadfast advocacy of the academe, like the UP College of Law, UP Institute of Human Rights, UP Institute of International Legal Studies and Center for International Law. This uh, primer on legal issues in reproductive health authored by Dean Raul Pangalangan, Professor Elizabeth Pangalangan, Professor Harry Roque and Professor Florine Hilbay is a welcome addition to the increasing positive literature on reproductive health. But more importantly, it will be our veritable ammunition when we venture to the next battleground, the Judicial Forum where the opponents of the RH bill vow to contest the constitutionality of an eventual RH law. 
So this is anticipatory of our fight before the Supreme Court. Let me, however, underscore that the detractors of the bill are the ones going to the Supreme Court. This means that they have conceded that eventually there will be a reproductive health law. Whose constitutionality they will challenge, albeit vainly and perfunctorily. Whether you call these challenges or just obstructions, I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, that the RH advocates inside and outside of Congress are ready to face this uh, obstructionism. And considering the lack of time and the lack a will at the moment of the leadership, we may not be able to have a vote on the RH bill before we take the Christmas break. This could have been the best gift Congress could have, could have given to the Filipino people, particularly the women and children. But we're not losing hope. Uh, we think and we will strive that before the Lenten break, before the Lenten break, we will be able to vote on this measure. And once we take a vote, I'm sure we're going to win the vote. And Lenten is an appropriate time to pass the measure. It will be a resurrection <laughs> for all these uh, salient features and beneficent objectives of the RH Bill for the Filipino nation. Marami pun salamat sa inyo lahat. Um, we would like to request Congressman Lagman to stay in the middle of the stage. Um, we would also like to request Congressman Marcoleta to um, go up on stage with the uh, primer authors, Attorney Agiling Pangalangan and Professor Helbay, for the presentation and ceremonial offering of the primer on legal issues in reproductive health. giving some copies to uh, Congress and we hope that the congressmen will read this. Also to help because we have two of the most active congressmen and uh, there are 103, seven authors and we are hope and we are 106 authors and we are hoping that other authors will uh, you know have the courage also to stay in front and answer questions as, as well as those who are undecided that this will help them decide. So we offer this to Congress. Thank you so much for this primer. I hope the authors could authorize us to make a summary of this primer for the easy reading of some members of Congress. <laughs> uh, we will be giving away copies of the primer for the students and for the rest of the audience after the forum. Um, our next speaker is an assistant professor at the UP College of Law, where he teaches constitutional law and philosophy of law. 
with emphasis on issues relating to church and state, post-colonial constitutionalism, and the relationship between the inf information environment and legal consciousness. He is the editor-in-chief of the Philippine Law and Society Review and the author of Unplugging the Constitution, published by the UP Press. To share his reflections on the primer, let us all welcome Professor Florine Hilby. Congressman Legman, Congressman Mari Coleta, Professor Beth Pangalangan, uh, colleagues in the faculty, uh, fellow students of law in the Grand Manor, good afternoon. Uh, the struggle of the disempowered majority to have an opportunity at exercising their basic and fundamental freedoms in a more effective way through an enhanced public information system and a welfare system um, continues with the attempt of Congress to pass the RH bill. We should consider ourselves quite lucky to have Congressman Lagman and Congressman Marcoleta, uh, two of the more vocal members of the House of Representatives as among our allies, uh, who are more than willing to rumble with Congressman Pacquiao in the debates over the RH bill. Uh, uh, it also indicates to you that there is a strong support at the broadest possible level for the passage of the RH bill. Uh, the majority of the members of the House, including the minority of the members of the House, have shown a lot of enthusiasm for the passage of the bill. Right, uh, the primer that we are launching today is the College of Law's hopefully not so minor contribution to the legal conversation over uh, the several aspects of the RH bill. I, have, I am quite sure that if or when the RH bill is passed, uh, hopefully sometime in March, uh, that the oppositors to the bill will find other venues and forum shop. And the best way to forum shop in this country is by transforming political conversations into constitutional arguments. Right. And so the primer is our contribution to uh, the potential debates in, in the Supreme Court over the constitutionality of the RH bill. What we have done in the primer is to provide you with uh, statutory, constitutional, and international grounding for the idea that the RH bill is not only constitutionally or internationally compliant, but in fact, as I say in my part, constitutionally mandated and required. Uh, the oppositors to the RH bill are strongly committed, and therefore I think we should find in our hearts and minds the power to match that kind of commitment. In fact, all forms of commitment when absolutely held or held blindly can produce the most wonderful of things and also the greatest of evils. And I think we should be able to match their commitment with commitment to supporting the plight of the disempowered majority, commitment to secularism, commitment to reason and rationality as basic platforms for promoting public policy. I'm not going to speak about the primer, the primer is there, uh, but I would ask you to match the commitment of the authors by not just reading the primer, but by distributing it. Uh, just like the, the attempt of the RH bill to lower the transaction cost of information over reproductive health, and contraceptive devices. Uh, the IHR, through Director Pangalangan, has lowered the transaction cost to information over the primer by distributing it for free. In fact, yesterday, I have instructed the College of Law Library to post a PDF file of the primer, which means that you can now download the primer, uh, read it, and 
distribute it through your e-groups and your social networks. I think the battle for the hearts and minds of people is already over, right? Uh, uh, but there is a large segment of the population that would like to be legally informed as to you know, uh, the normative uh, assumptions with respect to the passage of the RH bill. They would also like to have the necessary legal arsenal, the rhetorical weapons with which to uh, debate those who would like to oppose. I suppose there are also a segment of the population that is still thinking uh, about the constitutionality or some other grounds for uh, of the RH bill and would feel very happy to be uh, to have a work that is done by experts in family law, constitutional law, and international law. I am quite sure that if we are able to match the, this commitment by uh, an aggressive distribution campaign for uh, uh, the Premier, uh, we will be able to convince those who are still willing uh, to be convinced. Uh, there are some groups that will be immune to being convinced and so we'll just have to say good luck to them, right? Uh, see you in the Supreme Court. The Premier is, among other things, uh, as Congressman Lagman said, uh, a set of anticipated answers to constitutional objections uh, or other objections that will be raised by, uh, by opponents of the RH bill. I do not think that they are substantive, but they have to be answered because the forum of law is a formal forum and you have to answer them with the arsenal of law. And I am quite confident that we have enough uh, legal armaments to respond sufficiently to any uh, questions that they may pose. Uh, and so I, I will end by, by challenging your commitment by reading the Primer and hopefully distributing uh, the Primer. We are confident about what we have done. Why? Because we did it ourselves. Uh, and just like everything that we do here in the college, we did it in the grand manner. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you very much, Professor Hilbay. Now we're opening the floor for some questions. You can address them to the authors or to Congressman Lagman. <laughs> we have basically to the crowd. <laughs> They're still reviewing the primer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, if there are no questions, there are no questions. <laughs> this is your one chance. <laughs> Go there are more microphones in the. Yes. Uh, among the questions in this uh, primer, what is the most difficult that you found? <laughs> well, just anticipating, what was the most difficult uh, question that you tackled in this primer? Uh, most difficult question? Uh, None, in fact. <laughs> but I did find interesting some of the questions because where, when Professor Pangalangan asked me to, uh, to draft the primer, uh, and she specifically asked us to draft it in a Q&A style uh, so that you know, the general public can easily understand uh, the, the answers. Uh, what I found most interesting among the questions uh, was I think the question of, do we have to answer the query about when life begins uh, for purposes of uh, you know, uh, answering the constitutional challenges? And uh, the answer is no, you don't even have to go there. Uh, precisely because, and, and I always say this in, in my classes, uh, the question of when life begins is a political question, not a scientific question. Right. Uh, uh, you can look at you know biological processes, 
right? Uh, but for you to be able to attach a label to the biological process requires you to perform an act of will, right? Uh, say, for example, you can you know, do a timeline of the development of the fetus from the time of the sexual intercourse, right? Uh, but when exactly can you say life has already begun, right? Uh, uh, you see, reality is not a self-explaining phenomenon. <laughs> Uh, you have to attach a label to the things that you see for you to be able to explain them. And so for me, the challenge is to how to say what we wanted to say in a language that can be understood by everyone without, you know, uh, what, uh, without falling to the, the abyss that I am falling into right now, which is being very pedantic, actually. So I, that, that is what I found most interesting. But in general, what I really found challenging was, you know, uh, the... Uh, the attempt to go down from the level of legal jargon, uh, which is very comfortable, uh, a language in which we are very comfortable, to a language which we believe, at least, uh, will be generally understood by, by non-lawyers. I'm not sure if we succeeded, but uh, there was a genuine attempt on our part. Well, in terms of family law, what's always difficult is balancing the rights of parents, especially in our culture. Now, although the law says that there is the duty to obey only f for children, those below 18, there is always a duty to respect, which is until we're old and uh, adults ourselves. And in the context of the Philippines, the best way to show respect to one's parents is by obeying them. So balik dun sa obedience. And uh, so I think from our own experiences, we know that parents, as far as possible, will, uh, will uh, try to impose their authority on the children, especially also because even if we've reached college or the, uh, for my students here in law school in their second degrees, uh, they remain dependent on their parents. So there is always opportunity for parents to say that they should decide things for their offsprings. So it's difficult to explain, although it is in the law, no? to, to explain the balancing of interests uh, and that even if we're talking about minors, uh, the parents' rights are not absolute and they have to yield. And parents' rights are there only for the best interest of the child. No? So that's what I find uh, difficult to explain also because people will react in the many fora that I've been at. They always react, no, hindi naman totoo yan. No? For as long, I don't know, I always ask my class because I experienced this myself when my parents asked me or told me, for as long as you live in our house, you will follow our <laughs> rules. Diba that's so familiar. So when it comes to access to contraceptives if your parents say you can't or that's supposed to be what it is irrespective of of your belief of your actual practices uh, in a way the constitution has answered the question when life begins if we review the genesis of the constitutional provision which says the state shall equally protect the life of the mother and the unborn from conception. It says from conception, not from fertilization. <laughs> and uh, this uh, constitutional provision started with a proposal that uh, the fertilized ovum shall be entitled the right to life under the Bill of Rights. And that proposal was rejected by the, by the members of the Constitutional Commission. It was never constitutionalized. So from that uh, rejection, we can now say that the fertilized ovum is not entitled to the right to life. There is, no, there is no life there in the fertilized ovum as yet before it is implanted on the mother's uterus. That's again going into medical uh, science. The next proposition was the protection of the right to life 
should be from the moment of conception. But the members of the Constitutional Commission did not know when was the moment of conception. Because even the medical authorities are divided on this issue. When is the moment of conception? So they decided, they decided to have the present pressology. The state shall, pro shall equally protect the life of the mother and the unborn from conception. So uh, from that uh, genesis of this constitutional provision, we can say that uh, life does not begin at fertilization. And uh, fertilization and conception are two different phases in the reproductive process. And uh, if we also consult the, the proceedings of the Constitutional Convention, the principal and sole purpose of this uh, constitutional provision is to prevent the Supreme Court from legalizing abortion or to prevent Congress from passing a law legalizing abortion. And uh, if we look at the, uh, the, the provisions of the bill, uh, we are saying repeatedly that abortion is illegal, abortion is penalized under the revised penal code, and abortion is not one of the recommended methods of family planning. So that would answer the question on the constitutionality of this bill. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Jamiro Campo from AusAid. Uh, to Congress, uh, Congressman Lagman, my question is, uh, what can or what should the President do to ensure the legislation of RH before Lenten season next year? I mean, as a chief executive first, and secondly, as a member of Liberal Party. Uh, as, as I've said, uh, uh, most probably it is not sufficient for the President to just prioritize the enactment of this bill by recommending it to the LEDAC and to the Congress. He should do more. And he has, he has started doing more by asking the Speaker uh, in that uh, 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 unfortunate uh, uh, criminal justice summit <laughs> what's, what's dragging the bill? What's dragging the bill? I think uh, that is a start of what we, we feel the president should do. Then uh, the president has uh, the command at the moment of uh, his allies in Congress. And they're just waiting for the president to say, pass this bill. We have talked to a number of members of uh, the House who are ambivalent or opposed to the measure, and they're saying, kung ang, ang presidente sabihin, botohan namin to, then uh, susunod kami sa Pangulo. In the same manner that they have, uh, they have followed the uh, instructions of the president in other occasions. <laughs> and I don't want to articulate those occasions. <laughs> So, with respect to the Liberal Party, I, I tell you, that's a good question. Because uh, uh, as far as the Liberal Party is concerned, kakunti lang ang lamang ng mga members of the Liberal Party who are advocating for the passage of the bill. Halos pantay. Huh? So, the President can do a lot by uh, asking his... Uh, party mates to support the measure. Because this is one measure which should not be even partisan in nature. This is one measure which is long overdue. This is one measure uh, which is based on, uh, which is based on uh, uh, human rights. 
because uh, that would allow parents to responsibly and freely determine the number and space of their children. It is based on uh, maternal and child health and uh, consistent with our commitment to the Millennium Development Goals. And incidentally, uh, one uh, goal which cannot be attained worldwide is the improvement of maternal health. And then uh, uh, this is consistent with our yearnings for uh, sustainable human development. And, and this is pro-women and pro-poor. So these are, these are all the favorable aspects of this, uh, of this measure. At ako na ko ang Presidente, hindi naman ako talaga nga, uh, I will not be vacillating uh, in uh, endorsing to my party mates and my allies the enactment of this measure. Uh, maraming batikos na sa Pangulo, uh, I would not want to elucidate on those uh, batikos, but the, his endorsement of the RH bill is a feather in his cap. Yeah. So, Congressman, uh, do you think uh, it's really more on the moral suasion, the power of the president to morally persuade the Congress and not really getting into the real politics of getting a, a bill passed, particularly in terms of the use of pork, the use of appointments and, you know, electoral trading. You know, you, can, you can't compartmentalize the influence of the president. You could call it a human uh, moral suasion. You could call it in a more uh, vigorous language. But uh, as I've said in my short remarks, the, the power of the presidency to really push a measure or agenda is legendary. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Julie Swelgar no, of Likaan. My question is, there, there is a bill in both houses called uh, the right to the unborn, right of the unborn, which is actually being used as a foil to the RH bill. So I, I would like to ask uh, what you think of this, this uh, bill, but I would also uh, uh, like to, to refer to uh, a section in Professor Hilby's section where he raises the e equal protection. Is, yes, maybe you can explain that, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, let me first go to the prospects of these bills on the right to the, the right of the unborn. I assure you, Jonis, that bill will never be born. <laughs> yes, uh, I think one of the well apparently strong arguments of the opposers to uh, the RH bill is the language of the Constitution, which refers to, uh, which says something like, the Constitution shall equally protect the life of the mother and the life of the unborn from conception. And so the argument there is that there is a functional and operative equivalence between the life of the unborn and the life of the mother. And so therefore you cannot sacrifice the life of the mother or for or the convenience of the mother, or sorry, uh, the life of the unborn, for the convenience or the life of the mother. And so the answer there is by taking their arguments and flipping it. And so my basic answer is, you look at the language of the Constitution speaks of protect equally, right? Uh, or equally, equally protect, protect, not protect equally. You see, if the Constitution said, that it will protect equally the life of the mother and the life of the unborn, then that is a functional equivalence. But the, the use of the phrase equally protect means that the Constitution simply considers them both. Uh, equal protection is a language of constitutional law. You see, equal protection is the right to discriminate so long as the discrimination is not invidious. Uh, when constitutional law scholars talk about equal protection, they're talking about discrimination, actually. And so 
if you follow that particular language of the Constitution and use the jurisprudence of both the Philippine and American Supreme Courts, right, uh, you can make the strong argument, and I think it's a, a, a very rational argument, that uh, because the Constitution uses the words equally protect, right, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will functionally consider the life of the mother and, and the life of the unborn, however it is that you may define it, as, as equal. They're both entitled to consideration, but whether or not the consideration should be equal really depends on the state because it's, uh, it's so, so difficult you know, uh, to, to create a functional equivalence between the mother uh, who is alive, who has memories, who has feelings, right, uh, who, who thinks about uh, you know, uh, uh, money for the kids who has a family and the unborn generally broadly defined that is without memory, without organs, uh, nothing at all, right? Uh, I mean, if you want to be very cynical about it, you can consider it just a, a lump, right? Uh, but I mean, I wouldn't go there, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, and so it's, I think we should interpret the Constitution in rationally justifiable ways. And to say that, you know, uh, the mother and an unborn child, not even a fetus, in fact, right? Uh, you can say, well, a fetus, then maybe there's a strong state interest for an advanced fetus of, uh, say, six months, seven months. But unborn, meaning from the time it is conceived, right? Uh, uh, I mean, that's a broad range of potentiality you're talking about, right? Uh, compared to an actual life, right, uh, with memory, there's just no way you can create a functional equivalence. And so reason should yield to the way we interpret the Constitution, that's what I would say. Okay, yes, ma'am. Last question. Well, I'll, I, have, I have asked a number of doctors, including Eunice. You, you, you remember? Uh, uh, if there is a, a, an issue or a conflict, which, uh, whose life should be uh, protected? and prioritize the life of the mother or the life of the unborn. And medical practitioners have consistently said that it's the life of the mother because the mother is the patient, among others. Uh, and the, the Constitution uh, does not uh, demarcate absolute, uh, absolute uh, uh, treatment, you know. Within uh, the, the realm of equality, there can be some prioritization, hmm? rational prioritization. And even the, 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 the Constitution, in a way, has prioritized the life of the mother because uh, the Constitution says the state shall protect the life of the mother and the unborn. Now, only your mother, diba? Well, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Good afternoon to all of us. Um, uh, itutuloy ko lang po yung discussion ni uh, Congressman Lagman. Magayon na hapon po sa inyo. Yes, maray na hapon. Iyo po. Um, <laughs> sabi nyo nga po, protection for uh, mothers. No, I myself is a mother, a solo mother. And um, in the future, I will face uh, RA 8972, which is um, an, an act for the solo parents and my children. I'm also a student here in UP Diliman, and I've undergone RA 9262, Anti-Violence Against Women and Children. Now, my question is, if this bill will be passed, are there already prepared or ready institutions or centers who are willing to face and um, take the consequences of the bill? Because until now, as a mother, I cannot get um, much protection being a solo parent and a victim of violence? Well, I think uh, the, the legal infrastructure is already there. Yeah. There are so many laws, uh, for example, on uh, prevention of violence against women. Uh, it, it, it's not, the problem is not addressed to Congress. The problem is addressed to the executive for the implementation of these laws. And, and, and uh, 
let me just uh, tell you that uh, in the Committee on Women, there is a, there is a subcommittee on uh, protection of violence against women. And uh, that is very important. And uh, protection of violence against women is one of the salient features of the RH bill. Because the RH bill is not only about pills and condoms. It is more than that. And we have a, uh, a litany of uh, salient features. And among these uh, features would be protection no, uh, prevention of violence against women. And even uh, 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 prevention or cure of, uh, of infertility. Thank you, Congressman. With that, we would like to call on Professor Elizabeth Apangalangan to present our token of appreciation to Congressman Lagman. <laughs> Once again, thank you very much, Congressman. In behalf of the Institute of Human Rights and the UP College of Law, we would like to thank everyone for attending our forum today. Have a great day. May we invite everyone for snack outside? Uh -huh.